Bank of America's dire warning for stocks. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. B of A analysts are warning investors that the pain in the stock market is about to get worse, much worse. Let's head over to Bloomberg where we picked this stuff story up. As historic route isn't over yet, Bank of America strategists say stock lows yield highs yet to be reached, according to B of A's Hartnett. Well, Hartnett, you got one of those right. Strategist says current positioning shows paralysis not panic. The global market itself that saw the S&P 500 index post its worst first four months of a year since 1939 has furthered the run, according to B of A. Base case remains equity lows, yield highs to be reached. And well, we're going to challenge both of those. He's got one of them right. The other, well, you probably know which one he's wrong about. Let's continue on. Because this was the case that we talked about last week is the target. The average purchase price for most investors on the S&P 500 was just above 4,200, around 4,270. And Well Hartness said that if price breaks below 4,000, the people will turn into sellers. Now, the reason that happens is because most retail investors can't handle downside risk and they tend to sell when they're at a loss. In this case, we're not quite seeing that yet. The S&P 500. 500 is below 4,000, and investors continue to buy the dip. How low can this market go? Well, many experts say that we're looking at somewhere between the mid to low 3,000 to 3,500 on the S&P that will take us back near its two-year lows. Wow. And paralysis rather than panic best describes investors' positioning, saying the market is grappling with how the price in inflation and slowing growth. But the market's not having a problem pricing that in at all because what happens during periods of slower growth? And we know this is exactly what the Fed wants. They want to bring demand down to the level of supply. And we know supply is pretty low, so demand's kind of dropped. So what is the market really pricing in here? Well, if growth slows, then corporate profits slow. And if corporate profits slow, then stock prices need to come down to that level. So the market is actually accurately starting to price this in as the market head low, heads lower against fairly aggressive Fed tightening. And here we're a matter of weeks away before we see the beginning, the, the beginning of quantitative tightening and then a matter of about a month away from the next rate hike. And when growth slows, inflation slows. And you know what happens to interest rates during that time when growth and inflation expectations fall? Well, they go down, and that's where Hartnett's got it wrong. But lower stock prices? Yeah, there's more of that to come. Recession shock was priced in too quickly, he says, as this problem is stronger than expected economic data in the first half is causing the market to price in longer, bigger inflation rate shocks. Now, why is the economic data, or why was the economic data better in the first half of the year? Well, we were coming off all of this fiscal stimulus. Now, remember, there was still you know, lingering stimulus. There was still money in bank accounts that hasn't been spent, and that carried into the beginning of the year. And so, demand remained strong. Well, what about the Fed? They were still easing and all of a sudden they turned to tightening. So now we're in a position where no fiscal stimulus and the Fed's tightening and that's the game changer that many people are missing. Still, Hartnett noted that the average entry point for 1.1 trillion in inflows, an impressively large number to the S&P 500 since January 2021, was 4274 index points, meaning that investors are underwater, but only somewhat for now, with a gauge around 4147, now below 4,000. As bigger chunks are getting hacked out of post-COVID bull market, the ARC Fund, expensive tech stocks, are leading Wednesday or led Wednesday stock carnage as volume VIX and retail money flows show no capitulation sign as people continue to buy the dip. With the Federal Reserve showing no signs of wavering in its fight against inflation, concern is running rampant that the reversal is only just beginning. Strategists and technicians are looking for signs of panic, heavy volume days, and other indicators that mark a psycho psychological washout before they can call the sell off done and over with. So far, the all clear has been elusive. Sentiment is bearish, but not at capitulation levels. And that's really key here. Most investors are bearish, and yet they are buying. You can look at the tape and you can hear them say, I'm bearish. I think the market's going to go down. And it goes down, and they're buying the dip, buying the dip, buying the dip. They're convinced that this thing can go up and there's going to be a big bear market bounce. And so with that, we see the market liquidity is poor, which leads to greater volatility and market liquidity being lack of buyers as positioning among investors offers a mixed picture too. Professional investors such as head funds have cut their equity exposure to fresh loaves, but the day trader army in the face of mounting losses 
keeps pouring money into stocks in April, albeit at a slower pace. The ARK Exchange Trader Fund, which has gotten obliterated, has attracted money for four straight weeks despite dismal performance. And those buyers, well, they're now upside down in those purchases as well. And rarely do markets emerge sustainably from bear territory without retail throwing in the towel first. As such, continue to watch retail flows closely for signs of capitulation. And so far, we're not seeing any yet. But let's continue on because a stock market reality check may be necessary as prices are volatile as investors try to judge the risks of tighter money. And perhaps the one person that's got this right, but the economic risks are significant, notwithstanding Mr. Powell's assurances on Wednesday that the economy is strong. Even normal monetary tightening cycles produce financial casualties as liquidity ebbs, which is exactly what we're seeing as a drain in liquidity. This time around could be worse because the monetary excesses were so extreme in 2020 and 2021. The surprise will be if there are no nasty financial surprises, mean credit failures this year and next. And that's the key of what's driving the market lower here is a lack of liquidity. If you're concerned about your portfolio and you don't have a hedging mechanism built into it, well, be sure to check out Portfolio Shield. I'll put a link up here in the corner and the description below. Definitely over the last few days, it's certainly shining. And one thing that is shining in the economy happens to be unemployment claims remain rather low. But will that last? Well, probably not, because as the market goes down, so too does demand, and unemployment will likely head higher. Let's take a look at the numbers from this from last week. We now see unemployment claims rose just a mere 1,000 to 203,000. Remember, anything around the low 200,000s is a very strong labor market. And check this out. Total claims dropping 38,000 to 1.44 million, indicating that unemployed workers are having no trouble getting back into the workforce. But one thing that's going to change for all that is the producer price prices which have gone up and that's a sign actually of disinflation not inflation as most believe let's head over to the wall street journal headlines of producer price gains edge downward in april but remain elevated as a key reading of producer level inflation rose at 11 percent annual rate which it means has to mean inflation must get passed down but it's not as a fifth straight month of double digit increases the Labor Department today said producer price index would generally reflect supply conditions in the economy increases seasonally adjusted half a percent in April, which is high from the prior month. That marks a deceleration from the upperly revised 1.6% gain in March, which is off the charts, which was pushed up by surging energy prices that are now showing signs of cooling after Russia invaded Ukraine. April's rate of increase was the lowest since April 2021, but was higher than the average monthly gain of 0.2% in the two years before the pandemic, putting some color to just how big even a 0.5% gain is compared to an average of 0.2%. Let's continue on because producer prices rose 11%, which is huge on a 12-month basis in April. It's fifth consecutive double-digit gain easing from an upperly revised 11.5% increase the prior month. The March gain was the highest since records began in 2010. And here you can see why the high producer prices lead to actually lower producer prices. And the reason this happens is, you know, we will go back to that example. Remember a week or a week or two ago, we use this taco cart example where there's a taco cart in a high cost zone. It's very expensive to produce tacos there, but three blocks away, there's a low cost taco production area. And so you've got a cart set up in the low cost area. Maybe I've got a cart in the high cost area and I have a huge line. I have a huge demand of people that are willing to pay any price to get their tacos. And if I raise the price, they're still willing to buy. But for you, your prices are going up too, but nowhere near as much as I am because you're in a low cost area. Your wages are lower, taxes are lower, everything else is lower. But if you produce in my zone, your prices are going to be where I'm at. So how do you solve the problem is you produce tacos and have them ship three blocks over or just hire someone to walk over there and sell them. And you can do that and stay price competitive because as long as you're not producing them where I'm at, you can maintain a price advantage. And so what happens during periods of high producer prices in the US is foreign producers who have a much better cost advantage start flooding the US with imports 
and cheap imports, and that drives prices down. And that's why you see in this chart here, where we're looking at the trade balance. Now, notably, when the, when the trade balance goes down, that means the U.S. is getting flooded with imports. So note here in red, on a year-over-year -year rate of change, the producer price index is rising. So you can see it's trending higher here. You know, you can ignore the oscillations, but notice trending higher, and you see imports flooding and flooding and flooding in until producer prices come down. And here you can see a trend specifically here, but notably the trend started back in 2015 of higher producer prices and what happened imports coming in and, 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 and just flooding in and will eventually cause a problem for those high cost U.S. producers that will end up losing market share and laying off people and having to automate more to remain competitive. A lot of people don't understand U.S. workers do compete against foreign labor, and that's why we see such a high amount of automation in the U.S. But there's another reason we're going to see producer prices come down. It's because demand is going to come down, and that's just because the stock market is falling. As the market goes down, well, so too does demand, and so too does producer prices. Here you can see the Wilshire 5000, the total U.S. stock market in blue on a year-over-year -year rate of change against the producer price index, also on a year-over-year -year rate of change. And let's just start here in heading into the dot-com bubble. Notice how the market was coming down and producer price is still rising and all of a sudden they come crashing down. As demand falls, well then the supply leading to that demand needs to come down. And here you can see going into the great financial crisis, the market's coming down, producer price is rising mainly due to energy and all of a sudden it comes crashing down again. As demand falls, then what's creating that supply eventually comes down. And notice they have a pretty nice relationship here and generally the stock market is leading, but not always, but generally and here you can see the stock market heading down negative year over year rate of change, suggesting that it's only a matter of time before producer prices head lower. And with that, you'll also see consumer prices go down for the same reason, even though there's not a very good co correlation between the CPI and the PPI. In fact, arguably, there isn't really one at all, despite the claims there is. But notably, you'll see here, again, going into the dot-com bubble, stock market coming down on a year-over-year -year rate of change, and that leads to inflation coming down. And so this is where Hartnett's got it wrong. As growth comes down in blue, inflation comes down, and that's why you'll see here growth coming down, inflation coming down. So his notion that yields are likely to head to new highs are wrong, but without liquidity in the markets, well, the only question is, where does it stop? And generally, it's not until retail sells that it does. And at the rate we're going, well, retail hasn't even begun to sell. We haven't even seen the big flushing out moment. Well, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for being fans. Thanks for watching. Bye now.